Well, good evening, everyone joining us uh, via YouTube for what promises to be a really interesting uh, and I think potentially controversial discussion um, around the question, can we cure cancer? Um, if you do have questions, we absolutely encourage questions to come from the audience uh, and you can enter your questions in uh, via YouTube in the comment section or if you are on Twitter, you can submit your questions using the hashtag PintAU21. So please, this is supposed to be a really great interactive session. We have some fantastic panelists for you today, or tonight really, and, uh, and we encourage you to, um, to please get involved uh, via the questions. When we hold events at pubs around Australia as part of Pint of Science, we do ensure that we recognise the local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nation, uh, one of many that makes up the continent that we now call Australia. And now that we're holding this event online uh, and our speakers and much of our audience streaming, uh, are streaming from around Australia, we want to acknowledge all of the traditional custodians of country, uh, the first innovators and scientists of this land. And we pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing relationship with land, waters and culture. I am Dr. Claire Fidelli. Uh, I've been a cancer researcher for the past 15 years. And most of my research is based on the idea that in order to come up with better cancer treatments, we really need to understand uh, in a deep way what's going on inside cancers themselves. And we now call this approach precision oncology. And it forms the basis of ongoing efforts to develop what we, what are now known as targeted cancer therapies. And indeed, this approach does work. So we've seen over the past 10 to 15 years, significant advances in cancer treatments. And there are now what we call pillars of cancer treatment, and there are five of them now. Um, they are the traditional treatment approaches of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and surgery. And in recent years, we've added targeted therapy and the new kid on the cancer treatment block, which is immunotherapy, which is harnessing the power of our immune cells to, uh, to uh, kill cancers. But even with such advances, I think what I've really come to realise over the years is that the more we know about cancer, actually the more elusive a cure seems to become. And the reason I say this is because the complexity of cancer is at times simply overwhelming or seems overwhelming. Cancer isn't a single disease. It's not like we're, you know, there are other, other diseases where it's a single entity, the causes are known and they're common among people and they can be treated in a common way. With cancer, every single cancer in every single person is different. But more than this, what we now appreciate is that even within a single tumour themselves, we can have individual cancer cells that can differ from each other. And on top of that, over time, cancers can even evolve, adapt and change. So we have to start asking ourselves some questions about the idea of curing cancer if we're dealing with what is seemingly a moving target. I think some of the questions that cancer researchers are starting to ask and cancer clinicians is whether or not a cure for all cancer is actually realistic. Or perhaps do we need to change the way that we think about cancer treatment? Should we be more focused on prevention rather than treatment? And I think something that's certainly for me really interesting is what does cure really mean when it comes to cancer? And is it perhaps time for a redefinition? So to help tackle some of these really important questions and more, we've gathered with us tonight a fantastic team of panellists from a range of backgrounds who are all working in different ways to minimise the impact of cancer in the community. So I'd like to introduce our panellists for you tonight. Uh, first, we have Dr Nada Hamad, who is a staff specialist haematologist at St Vincent's Hospital, president of the Australian New Zealand Transplant and Cellular Therapy Society. We have Dr, Dr. Eleonora Folletto, who is a senior research fellow at the Daffodil Centre, Dr. Nick Fletcher, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Queensland, and Dr. Ken Dutton-Register, who is a research officer at QIMR Berghofer 
and founder and director of Excite Science. So fantastic to have you joining us all tonight. Um, what we might do is, is start uh, with, in your own words, actually, we'll go around our panellists and ask them to give a brief explanation or an overview of their research. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to put them on the spot, actually, and I'm going to ask them the question whether, in their opinion, we can actually cure cancer. And I would like you, if you will, the audience, to have a think about this question as well and form in your own mind whether or not you believe at this stage we can cure cancer. And perhaps we'll revisit that question at the end to see whether our panellists have perhaps changed your mind. So we'll firstly go to Associate Professor uh, Nada Hamad um, and we'll get you to do a bit of an introduction, please, Nada. Thank you so much, Claire. And um, it's a pleasure to be to able to talk about um, what I do. I'm a hematologist and I work predominantly in malignant hematology or looking after blood cancers. Blood cancers are diverse, so there's many of them. There's so many different types. And we've learned a great deal in the last couple of decades about blood cancers and how to treat them and, in fact, how to cure them. So you can probably tell I'm around uh, in that uh, Cure Kim. Um, I, I predominantly work with patients in terms of treatments. We use targeted therapies, we use um, immune therapies, we use bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapies like CAR T cell therapies. These are all amazing technologies that harness not only the patient's immune system, but donor's immune systems as well to cure cancer. And although my day job predominantly is treating patients, I am also a clinical trialist and a researcher. So I am a principal investigator or primary investigator on many studies on new agents, new treatments, new molecules, sometimes first in human studies or phase one studies where the, you know, the, the, the compound has not even been tried in humans before. And it's really about bringing those new options and opportunities for novel treatments to Australia, to New South Wales, to Sydney, to my hospital to offer patients possibility if their cancers are not curable by other methods. I'm also a researcher in terms of deliverability of cancer therapy, so I do some work in rural and regional uh, New South Wales. And for me, it's really important to be able to extend all these amazing technologies that we have that can cure cancer to patients in rural remote areas. So it's not just about the amazing work that we can do in the lab and in terms of delivering really interesting treatments, but how do you get it to patients? And uh, you know, at a deeper level, as a, an, a feminist, I really believe in um, you know taking into account the psychosocial context of a patient. Um, women struggle with a number of things in society and culture, and that goes for multiple ethnicities and disadvantaged groups. But to be able to think about a patient in their own context and how you can deliver care in the most appropriate way. So looking after women during cancer treatment, making sure that they're supported, uh, making sure that we are taking into account their hopes and dreams about fertility and planning families and patients who develop cancer during pregnancy. So although my research in terms of clinical trial and novel agents is very interesting, I'm also very interested about researching how we best deliver care to patients near to home and also taking into account their own personal psychosocial context. Thank you, Nada. Incredible work. You mentioned that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as a hematologist, you employ, um, amongst other things, these newer types of therapies, including immunotherapy. Can you perhaps give our audience a bit of an overview about what immunotherapy is and how much of a game changer has this technology been um, for cancer treatment, in but in particular for um, the treatment of blood cancers? So immune therapies and targeted therapies, I mentioned to you before, they were born in hematology. We did it first before anyone else. And it was really because um, hematology is a liquid um, sort of specialty. So we can actually look at individual cells and look at their makeup of each cell. And we could do that much more easily, even with limited technology in the past. And you can identify cancers where there's a specific genetic mutation. Chronic myeloid leukemia is one of those, cell, one of those cancers where there's one mutation that is the cause of a life-threatening illness. And you can target that mutation with a drug that turns it off, and then there's the cure. 
So you don't even have to go through chemotherapy. You don't have to go through um, difficult, complicated procedures like bone marrow transplantation like we used to do. And in, in hematology, we use bone marrow transplantation um, to treat bone marrow failure, where the bone marrow, where all your blood is made, just stopped working, whether because of a cancer or because it just disappeared for whatever reason. And, you know, we think about um, nuclear holocausts and nu nuclear disasters and bone marrow is failing because of radiation exposure. That's where, you know, bone marrow transplantation was born. But once it was born in the 60s, we discovered that there is an immune surveillance that comes with bone marrow transplantation. When you transplant somebody else's bone marrow, you find that that new bone marrow, that new immune system can actually minimize the recurrence or the relapse of cancer. And that's where the idea came that, you know, perhaps you can use the immune system's ability to surveil your body and be a policeman or a police check on abnormal cells that are emerging so that they get knocked out before they develop into a full-blown cancer. And in certain circumstances, you can, you know, trigger the body to level up that immune system, you know, if people talk about immune system boosting, and if this is not immune system boosting in the traditional sense, it is really to try and turn on the body system and look specifically for cancers and knock them out. Uh, so that's what immune therapy is. There are a variety of methods to do this. You can use bone marrow transplantation. You can use cellular therapies where you engineer the body cells to attack a specific cancer, and that's just really, really exciting work. That's CAR T cell therapy, which has now become more available in Australia. And there are targeted immune therapies where you can design a drug to specifically attack a cell based on its immune profile or the proteins on the surface of the cell. So there are now multiple ways you can harness the immune system to attack cancers or knock out cancers and potentially cure cancers, in, at least in the blood cancer space. So it seems, I probably don't need to ask, but do you think there is a cure for cancer? I think there are cures for some cancers because we've done it, you know, so we've cured chronic myeloid leukemia. That is the highlight of my life in my lifetime that I've been able to witness that, you know, the change from a life-threatening illness when I was a junior doctor to, a, you know, a cancer that is now curable and people live longer than they're supposed to even live um, with chronic myeloid leukemia extremely good quality of life, no chemotherapy, no complications. So there is hope for certain cancers that present a more simple mechanism of cancer. Now, of course, there are more complex cancers that are very clever. They can evade the multiple strategies that we use. That's not to say we may never be able to achieve that. The more we learn about complexities of cancer, um, the way that evade the therapies we use, the better we're gonna get at it. But there's certainly some cancers that are curable and I think the more we know, we're probably more likely to cure more cancers over time. But it is a very exciting space to be in because, you know, from the lab all the way to treating patients, we have evolved so much even in the last decade. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Nada, for that wonderful insight. Um, we've already got some questions coming through from our audience. Again, <clears throat> excuse me, we encourage everybody to submit your questions via <clears throat> the comment sections in YouTube or via Twitter using the hashtag PintAU21. So we might move on to uh, Dr. Eleonora Folletto. Um, you're uh, taking a slightly different approach to uh, the cancer um, problem, I guess we can call it, or the challenges that, that are currently facing um, uh, us in the world of cancer. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis um, to try to minimise the, the impact of cancer on our community? And then I will ask you also whether you believe there will be a cure for cancer. Great, thanks, Claire. What an act to follow after Nada. So I'll do, I'll do my very best. But uh, I have, as Claire mentioned, a very different approach. I work at the newly formed Daffodil Centre, which is a joint venture between Cancer Council New South Wales and the University of Sydney. And we have more of a epidemiological and mathematical modelling approach. So we look at cancer from a population level in certain instances and also take a very public health view um, when we are looking at how, how do we assess the burden of a particular type of cancer and what we might do in that space. 
Uh, my group looks at gastrointestinal cancers, so we focus predominantly on bowel and liver cancers. And we very much look at the earlier end of the cancer journey, so we very much talk about prevention and early detection. So uh, unlike NADA, we uh, get the very unsexy and very restrictive job of saying don't do things. So don't smoke, don't drink, eat your greens, uh, you should exercise and very much definitely don't eat bacon. Um, so those are hard messages to give people, but essentially what we're saying is, is be healthy. And we know that being healthy actually can help in a whole lot of diseases, not just cancer. When it comes to uh, early detection and screening, there's a whole other world of what, what can we do about cancer. Um, as I mentioned, I work in bowel cancer and we have a national bowel cancer screening program that's available and what that can do is actually catch cancer before it even develops um, or at a very early stage where um, the survival rate is about 99%. So there are ways we can intervene and what we look at is, well, if we were able to intervene at an earlier stage, what would that mean? And so our, as I mentioned, we have a bowel cancer bowel cancer screening program. Uh, current participation is around 40% and we were able to estimate that if uh, that were increased to 60% that we would be able to save um, an additional 84,000 lives. So what we're talking about are Australian lives and uh, how people can avoid even being diagnosed with cancer in the first place. So I'm going to preempt your question already Claire and say if you're talking, if we're talking about curing cancer, well, why couldn't we talk about not getting cancer? <clears throat> and there are some cancers I absolutely acknowledge. Um, we know that it's about one third of cancers are preventable. Um, there are cancers that aren't preventable, and there, well, absolutely, we should be looking at the treatments that are the most effective. Um, so I guess that's. That's where my research interest lies, and it's not only in, uh, it gets even unsexier, um, in that I spent a couple of years working at the International Agency for Research on Cancer in France, and I had the pleasure of working on a project um, in one of the largest still functioning asbestos mines in the world, in the Russian Federation, so looking at occupational exposures. Uh, that increase your risk of cancer and uh, fortunately that's not something that we have to deal with um, prospectively so in the future here but we are still dealing with what what used to happen here in Australia and how we used to use asbestos in different products and what the impact um, is on Australian health. So I guess again I've already I've already laid it out there of what my position is. Prevention is certainly something that I stand behind. 84,000 lives you predict that you'll be able to save if you get the screening up. I mean, that's quite extraordinary. Have you seen over recent years more of an emphasis on prevention research? I guess, you know, maybe in the past there hasn't been so much, you know, there's been a lot of re uh, research into the cures. Have you noticed, that, do you think that we are putting or investing more in prevention research if the potential is so great to save so many lives? Yeah, look, when we get to, uh, when we talk about prevention research from a, a, a risk factor perspective, so if we're thinking about um, obesity, for example, or other uh, risk factors like that, it, Researching that area is hard. It's hard to show outcomes. It's hard to show that it works in the long term because you need such a long lead time. Um, what we're able to do in lots of different um, situations is uh, we're able to use models. So we've, we've seen this a lot with the COVID, with the pandemic. We saw a lot of mathematical models being used, being revised, being updated. And so we're um, looking to use those to, um, uh, we're looking to use those models to see well, what impact would shifting a risk factor have and I suppose one of the clearest examples is in smoking that we've seen different 
tobacco control interventions have really impacted smoking levels, but also uh, what um, uh, lung cancer predominantly. It, it is associated with a lot of uh, cancers. But now, I mean, smoking has changed as a problem. We're now talking about vaping and what impact that has. And so the conversation keeps changing. Wonderful. Really interesting, Eleanor. Thank you. Dr. Hi. Nick Fletcher, you're coming at um, the question around cure by trying to develop some new approaches for treatment. Can you give us a bit of an overview about what your research entails and why it's new and, and how it differs from the treatments that are currently available for cancer? Yeah, so thanks for that. First up, what an actor follow with Nanada and Eleanor. You guys have done some really cool stuff. Um, so I've actually ended up falling into nanomedicine research and looking at different ways to target cancer out of my PhD, which was completely unrelated. So that's been a fun few years. Um, so in the time since doing that, uh, I've been working with nanoparticles. So one of the big problems we see with a lot of the current therapies is that we're trying to treat cancer or cancer cells, which are a specific subpopulation of cells in the body with chemotherapy or radiotherapy that can't really tell one cell from the other. So they're sort of dumb therapies. So uh, what we do is try and package these up in nanoparticles. Um, so uh, very small uh, materials, like thousands of times smaller than a human hair, and um, try and deliver these therapies uh, or repurpose existing therapies uh, for better efficacy uh, in the body. Um, so the, the research I do is particularly focused on using polymers to do this. So like tiny, tiny uh, plastic materials, they're very, very small, and we can specifically design these with all sorts of different drug payloads or radiation payloads, and then try and engineer them to really specifically release them only in the tumor or only once they're internalized into the cell. So um, what's going, uh, what this does is really tries to minimize the delivery to the rest of the body. Um, and that's just about as important to us as actually delivering more efficaciously to the tumor, is minimizing that off-target dose limited uh, um, side effects. Because if we can't dose you because we're going to damage some other organ, what's the point? Um, so what we're doing now is really trying to engineer these to specifically target those cells so we can decorate them with all sorts of targeting ligands or molecules that will help accumulate in the tumour. Um, and uh, then also engineer them to really specifically, under specific stimulus in the cell, release that uh, payload that they're carrying. And what we're doing now is similar to what Nardo was talking about, is trying to make these uh, precision and patient-specific approaches. So um, even looking at using immunotherapies or immunological targets. So we can take a sample from uh, a patient, in our case, um, mostly preclinical, but we're working with some um, canines. We actually worked with uh, large animals. So we're getting in dogs from the community that have cancer, doing specific screening on these patients and trying to work out what their cancer expresses. And then we can make a therapy that then very specifically delivers therapy to their um, specific tumor. So this is working really well so far, and we're sort of moving towards clinical translations of these. So we're a bit further behind uh, Nada and Eleanor's work, but hopefully be collaborating with you guys soon. Um, uh, and so largely the work we've been doing the last few years, we're based at the Center for Advanced Imaging. So which is the name suggests is all about imaging. So we're really trying to, now that we've got these materials, uh, image them at even smaller and smaller uh, sizes and better definition to work out exactly what they're doing in the body, how they're interacting with these cells, uh, what barriers they're encountering, and then how they're uh, really drill down on what they're doing and how they interact with the cancer cells there, and then how we can make that better, how we can make it uh, do whatever we want it to do faster, better, um, far more efficaciously, whatever we like. Right, wonderful. Right, wonderful. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, so, so for someone like me who doesn't really know a lot about nanoparticles, mm -hmm. they sound pretty fancy. What are they actually and why are they able to work so specifically? What is it about the technology or the features of a nanoparticle make it better than, you know, for example, just putting a chemical straight into the body? How do they really, what is it, what is it, what feature about the nanoparticles allows them to be directed straight to a tumour so that they can have the more specific effect? Um, so, so what we do um, is take uh, polymers, so sort of like plastics. So you have long, long chains of small building blocks that we can stick together in very controlled, specific ways. 
And what that means is we can then control, say we've got a long chain, we can control what's on one end versus the other, attach the drug to that, or attach targeting leads to the other end, or attach imaging probes, so we can um, design these very specifically to interact the way we want them to. We build them out of um, polymers that are intentionally relatively stealthy. Uh, we call them stealthy, so they don't interact with uh, things in circulation. They'll try and not just bind to random cells they encounter, but we can make them specifically interact with cells. And then what's really cool is there's actually, um, once you get down to the nanoparticle size, so sort of that nanometer range, the particles themselves actually localize to the tumor um, based on the uh, physiology in the tumor. So there's leaky vasculature, it's poor lymphatic drainage, and these nanoparticles, even if we don't target them, do tend to just naturally build up in these tumors, in solid tumors anyway. Um, and that lets us treat these, and then we can boost that further by adding these targeting agents or um, approaches to help interact with the cells we want them to. So Nick, you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you think that these sorts of technologies, so, so obviously there's always new technologies being developed um, that promise to be more specific, more effective. Do you yep. think that the development of these sorts of technologies are ultimately going to lead us to a cure where we can say a diagnosis of cancer means that you have a very high likelihood of being cured and going on with your life? Are, you know, is, is, are the technological advances going to be enough to say we're going to get a cure for cancer, in your opinion? I think for many cancers, I'm going to take Nada's scapegoat and say for most, I think we can find an approach that will work. So even if we are able to work out a particular patient needs a particular therapy which will boost their response, I think that's a benefit in itself. For um, So yes, in most cases, I think we can do it. Um, there's always new nanoparticles. So trying to class nanomaterials as one thing or nanoparticles as one thing is there's hundreds of types of nanoparticles. Um, which one's going to be the best? I don't know. Um, my, my money is on something like what I'm working with, but that's just because I'm biased, I think. Um, there are lots of uh, nanomaterials already working in the clinic and they do work. Um, and that's really cool. So we're sort of uh, using those stepping stones to sort of build that, ride that wave and try and get these into the clinic, I think. Great. Well, it's good. It's good to have confidence in your research. We have confidence in your research too, and we certainly hope that you're right. That the ones you're working on uh, are the ones that are really going to get us to uh, to that point. Now, if again um, for our audience, if you have more questions, we've got a we've actually got a fantastic list of questions um, that we'll get to after we introduce our last panelist. But please do submit your questions in the comments section um, on YouTube or via Twitter using the hashtag. Uh, pint AU21. Uh, and we'll get to our final panellists who've been waiting patiently. Uh, we have Dr. Ken Dutton Register, who is a researcher for us uh, at QIMR. Um, but he not only is uh, um, a research scientist, but is taking a slightly different approach to tackling um, the cancer uh, challenge. Um, and I would just, uh, I'd like Ken to introduce a little bit about your approach, Ken. Um, I believe using education perhaps as a way to cure. Yeah, yeah. So as, as noted by the other speakers, you could really see the depth of talent that we've really brought up here in Australia. And I think that really emphasizes the point of the value of investing in medical research. But uh, sorry, as, as Claire mentioned, I'm a bit of an oddball case. So I started my search back in 2008, 2009, and really trying to explore the genetic mutation landscape of melanoma, a type of skin cancer. And so I really had the opportunity to embrace a new sequencing technology to unearth and discover you know, why melanomas were occurring at the genetic level. And as Nada sort of mentioned before, some of those uh, mutations can actually be targeted through different therapies. And so I was really trying to help and try to identify some of these new drug targets through these mutations. Um, I ended up in Boston for a couple of years and then started learning about some new gene editing technologies. Um, some of the audience might know have heard about CRISPR. And we were really using that technology to try and turn off or eat different genes in cell lines to identify which genes were really important to the growth of that cancer. And by combining that with genetics, we really could identify new drug targets. But 
interestingly, I thought trying to cure cancer wasn't wasn't enough for me. Um, and I sort of really was more intrigued by Eleonora's uh, problem of having sexy prevention messaging. And I thought I'd decide to take on that challenge. And so instead, I decided to launch a startup company called Excite Science and we're getting a massive science themed, cancer themed pop up experiences that explain complex cancer biology in fun ways. So um, in the background here, this is from our cancer biology themed escape room. So we're using gamification and puzzles to teach people about cancer. Um, I've also co-created a virtual reality game. And more recently, you know, thanks to the Brisbane City Council Innovation Grant, I've been working on a cancer a art gallery. So we're pairing cancer researchers with different creatives to create artworks around cancer biology, really using nostalgia and pop culture references. And I thought I'd just quickly show everyone one of the first artworks. God, this is a bit awkward. So this is the, the BRAF mutant immunopositive melanomas, and it's really playing on us, talking about some of the evolution of the targeted and immune-based therapies and the dramatic success that it's had in the treatment of melanoma, going from 5% survival when I first started my research up to now 50% survival, which is dramatic progress in 10 years. So I mean, it's it's fascinating, and I think um, I think it's a fantastic um, demonstration of. Uh, the new ways that scientists can perhaps start engaging with the community in a, in perhaps a, some non-traditional ways. We we have a tendency to sort of stand you know in our ivory towers and 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 preach down. And I think that it's wonderful that um, that you're you're working in such an engaging way. What sort of responses do you tend to get from people who come and engage with your um, I guess science artwork? Um, and you know is 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 it really fulfilling what what how do you feel uh when when you get different responses i guess yeah so the art gallery hasn't been launched yet um and we're thinking we might have a a, a soft soft pre-launch maybe in july so uh follow follow our website www.excitescience.com to find out when we might be popping up but mainly we've mostly used the escape room in different formats and we've popped up at a variety of different locations from uh, Otacon, uh to you know museum pop-ups. Um, we popped up at a beach one time, and it's really interesting to see the response. So traditionally, escape rooms tend to attract uh, millennial or below audiences, so the ages of forty and below, and that's definitely what we see. But it's really surprising to see the reaction from those that are under the age of fifteen, because a lot of this age category have seen uh, an escape room on YouTube, but they haven't been able to experience one. And when we come in and have this, you know, sometimes free pop-ups that they can sort of participate in, they're just super excited to, the, to do an escape room. Um, not really thinking about it from a cancer perspective. Once they get in there, there's all this sort of messaging that we, we introduce around the reasons why cancer occurs and how you can change your behavior to try and reduce your risk. And it's really the power of having cancer researchers on site to be able to talk to people at the end of it, to really use the escape room as a conversation starter. And I think it's been really powerful from the, the, the responses that we've seen so far. So wearing your researcher hat and or your communicator hat, what do you think about the question of whether we can cure cancer? And do you think that education is going to play a role in contributing to this idea of prevention rather than necessarily cure? It's a tough one. I, I could definitely go either, either way. I think, yes, we can cure cancer, but not yet. And the other question going back to Eleanor is like, do we need to cure cancer? And I think that probably is a yes. But I think cancer education at a broad level so it hits multiple different categories because cancer education is not only reinforcing behavior choices to prevent cancer, but we're teaching people the reasons why and how we treat cancer and really can tackle misinformation, which is really important when it comes to cancer treatments because delay in therapy can create your cancer to be more aggressive. And when you pivot to other therapies that may be more effective, it could be too late. So I think um, cancer education definitely approaches um, multiple facets of this very interesting question. Fantastic. Well, I think, thank you to all our panelists. I think we've really set the scene now for 
a very, what is bound to be a very interesting discussion. We have a number of questions that have come in from our audience. So absolutely fantastic that we've, um, that we've got a really engaged audience joining us tonight. So welcome and thank you to everyone who's, who's joining us on YouTube. If you did want to be part of the conversation, please post your um, questions in the comment section um, or on Twitter using the hashtag PintAU21. So let's get stuck into some audience questions, should we? So um, there's a specific one for Eleonora actually to kick us off. Um, and the question is, you talk about diet as important for preventing bowel cancer, but we often get mixed messages perhaps from the media about what you can and can't eat. Do you think the mixed messaging uh, causes harm to prevention efforts? Uh, I would say yes, absolutely. And I really, uh, I want to answer, I really be ha I'm keen to hear what Ken has to say about uh, the media and their messaging as well. Um, we do know that media tend to like tantalising headlines and sometimes that can really interrupt what the um, main point is. And I mean, look, I did exactly the same. I said, definitely don't eat bacon. And that's <laughs> not necessarily true. We do know that processed meat certainly does increase your risk of um, certain types of cancer, bowel cancer being one of the main ones. It doesn't mean you should never eat it. I mean, um, you can choose if you have bacon with your eggs or not. Uh, we do have a responsibility to put out messages that are clear. Um, and that can be quite difficult. There is a lot of marketing going on. There are a lot of people trying to sell us things and they're not necessarily looking out for our best interest or trying to reduce our risk. And to be honest, it's our individual responsibility. So I would say, again, healthy lifestyle is certainly what we all need to aspire to. And I'm not um, suggesting that I'm perfect at that either. Um, but Ken, do you, do you have any uh, comments about marketing and media? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it definitely can be a challenge. And I think um, it sort of comes down to, I think, the community really understanding excessive science. And I think, you know, as scientists, we know that you do a study, um, but it's one and only answer to that question. It often requires replication. And sometimes with certain questions, it can be very uh, challenging or the, the effect size can be very, very minimal in between it. And in this sense, you know, the, the coffee or the diet is, is a perfect example of this where the effect size can be very small and very different depending on how you cut and approach the, the question. And this is why you get these headlines of like, one day it prevents cancer and the other day it, it, it affects it. And so I think one of the challenges that we really need to address is really teaching people how the scientific process works to really understand that it's not really useful to look at a, a study in isolation. It's the whole body of it. And unfortunately, this is a very challenging thing to do. And it requires a lot of time on the on behalf of the, the individual. Um, so this is going to be a constant challenge, I think, for, for the sector. It's a very topical, um, it's very topical actually, probably uh, right at the moment where science is at the forefront of mainstream media. Um, and we've seen some examples of very good communication and we've seen some examples of very poor communication and the impact that that can have on um, public health. And, you know, I think what's now becoming more and more evident is that, you know, we as a research community and a clinical community really need to get out there um, and engaging with the public and, and, and we play a part in all of this as well. We have a question for Nada. Um, you work in both treating patients and developing treatments. How difficult do you find it to communicate different treatment options with patients for example, the risks and benefits of each, given that new technologies are constantly being developed? I think it's not as difficult as people think. Um, you know, the first steps that I take when I talk to patients about their diseases, and of course every disease is different, is to take the time to explain the disease to them and explain why certain treatments work and how they work and the different options in terms of complications and also the benefits. Now, 
one might think there may be a you know a huge repertoire of options but in reality that is not true because once you've understood the patient's cancer or it's the disease itself and the risk factors that patient comes along with those options actually narrow and then emerge as maybe one or two at best and very rarely three options and it's really important to empower patients in the knowledge of their own disease their own risk factors so the other diseases they may have you know a patient with multiple other diseases is not the same as a young patient with no other complications and so trying to explain how that will impact the way they can tolerate a treatment is really important um you know and i i practice sort of medicine in a way that i you know traditionally most people would think is how we would normally do it but for me it's really really important to explain things in a simple way as possible and checking that patients understand um you know sometimes with the time pressure we don't have that luxury but it is so important to be able to do that in the beginning so that patients have a good foundation and understanding of what their diseases what treatments are getting if things go right and if things go wrong why that happened thanks thanks nada um eleanor i might uh put another question to you uh there's a question um from your on youtube um referring to a recent study that came out around screening for ovarian cancer which i don't know if you're aware of the results of a, um, a three-decade screening program for ovarian cancer that actually found that um, early detection was not um, effective in ultimately reducing death um, from the disease. Um, so that, what do you, is your opinion on that? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that research, but um, does it pose the question, um, does early prevention always necessarily translate to um, and improved survival from cancer? And do we therefore need to still be really going hard at cures? Yeah, look, it's an excellent question and a really interesting study that came out recently. So as you mentioned, they um, were looking to trial a, a screening a method for ovarian cancer. And as with all other research, you need a very long period of time to do that. So it was a study that started quite a long time ago and positive, there were positive preliminary results. And then the results that have currently come out have said that actually screening is probably not the way to go with ovarian cancer. I, I guess, and, it, and this comes down to communication again as well. It doesn't mean that there's nothing that we can do for ovarian cancer. What we're looking at is, is there a screening program that we can apply to the whole population without taking into consideration too many other factors? When we're talking about population screening, we really have to weigh out what are the benefits what are the harms? Because generally there are harms in, um, associated with them and what are the costs involved? And balancing those three things isn't an easy feat. So uh, in the case of ovarian cancer, that probably isn't where we thought there might be an intervention. So for a cancer to have a screening intervention, you need a, a, a longer lead time. So a time where, you're, um, where, where there is a way you can intervene. Um, so my understanding of the study is also that, that they really need to look into the data in more detail to see what actually happened there and the thinking is perhaps it was because the cancers that were detected with the screening test were actually more aggressive. So they did find more cancers, it just didn't have the mortality outcomes. So they weren't able to um, stop people from dying from ovarian cancer. So perhaps they were more aggressive and they were going to find and they were going to eventually get the ovarian cancer in the end so we have other opportunities to do that in other cancer types um, in a different way so cervical cancer is an excellent example we know that almost all cervical cancers are caused by HPV, which is a virus which we have a vaccination for and we have a test for, and if we um, find it early, then we can completely eliminate it. So it's a different, in that case, a cure has a very different sense. In the case of ovarian cancer, it 
perhaps it is something where we do need to refocus on treatment or perhaps even look at the screening program and see if there's another way of, um, of doing that. If, if I could quickly intersect there, I think that's really interesting because I think currently in the melanoma landscape, we've, we're getting a, a similar issue. So uh, there was a really controversial sort of paper in terms of the field that came out, I think, a couple of months ago, and they looked at the rising incidence of melanoma. So if you look at the rates of melanoma that's been occurring over time, it's been on this sort of like continual sort of slope, suggesting that there's a melanoma epidemic. But when you actually think about it, you'd think that if we're detecting more, then that would be having a positive effect on improving survival. But if you look at the survival rates that they haven't really sort of had as a dramatic impact. And there's, there's really a sort of theory out there that maybe we're actually overdiagnosed or being uh, more aggressive in terms of what we define as a melanoma, particularly with like these really cutting edge techniques, tools that we can really see in depth. And uh, it, it sort of like has created this potential question, you know, like, do we, do we need to be as aggressive and make sure we check every single lesion and, you know, constantly monitor and cut anything out that looks anything suspect? Um, it's really sort of divided the field and it makes it very challenging when it comes to like public messaging. Um, but I think overall, the general advice does come down to being alert and aware of your body and what's happening is, is definitely a positive thing. And if you see anything that looks dodgy, definitely go get it checked out. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I think it highlights also the importance of um, really drilling down into the data and, and perhaps, you know, the headline, not just listening to to the headline um, that that even though perhaps something um, on the surface looks like it's a negative result, actually, it's important to drill down into the reasons why we might be seeing some of these um, some of these results and and um, yeah, and, and focusing on what they mean and how we can make improvements for the future. Now we have a, a really great question, I think, because I think we've been a little presumptuous in our discussion about cancer cure in that we've restricted ourselves to talking about curing cancer in humans, but we haven't really addressed whether or not there are actually any options for curing cancer in other organisms, organisms that many of us hold dear, such as our pets. Uh, and there's an, actually a question for Nick asking whether you might be using dogs as a model organism for your nanoparticle research or whether um, uh, there's a, even any research into uh, curing cancer in non-humans or in our pets. So as a dog owner, you might have very few affordable options for a cancer diagnosis if it's made in your pet. Is this something that you think about, that you look at? Um, yeah, Nick. Definitely. So I've got a dog wandering around behind me somewhere at the moment. Um, but yeah, no, so we have, uh, we would call them canine patients because they're definitely found out in the population, the people's pets that are brought in. Um, we've got some really awesome collaborations going with the vets. So some of the best vets up in uh, Brisbane up here. So they already do a range of cancer therapies. So if you can get radiation therapy for humans, you can get it for your cat. You can get um, radiation dosing for thyroid cancer things. If you, it, like you said, there is probably a monetary barrier to some of these therapies in pets because there's not the um, uh, healthcare system that would help you for uh, humans, but there is definitely interest in doing it and people do approach us already. So we uh, have done several trials where we've started dosing uh, pet dogs that are particularly with prostate cancer is where we're focused at the moment. So canines are one of the only animals outside of humans um, uh, that develop pro prostate cancer in a similar way to humans. So that makes them both interesting for us and a really, uh, it's really nice to be able to actually treat uh, a patient with our materials um, without having to go through some of the hurdles to work into the clinic, which is where we're building towards now. Um, some of those results look really cool. So we can do all these imaging studies and show that, yes, we can get our nanomaterials into their um, particular tumours with the right receptors. Um, we have seen some positive uh, uh, treatment outcomes um, with less side effects, which is the other main thing we're really interested in seeing. So um, it's still early days yet, but it's looking promising and definitely an option. Yeah, yeah I was going to say there's there's also some, um, there's also some interesting uh, groups in the US. I remember attending the Society for Melanoma Research one year and there was a, a group uh, in the US, a nonprofit that literally um, compiles uh, 
dogs who have cancer who their owners really would like to treat and they actually pair them up with you know, human cancer researchers who are working on new drugs and try and connect them together to really act as as models to sort of see if that can sort of help progress um, not only treat the, the dogs can also feed back into the human human treatment so i think it's, it's a interesting avenue yeah the us is definitely ahead of australia just partly because of i think the research money there and the number of uh dogs around i guess um but yeah we uh work close with some of the guys over there there's um pathologists who do only dogs and their cancers and it's really cool to work with some of those guys yeah fascinating fascinating discussion but ken there's a question um there's some interest around uh virtual reality and how you might employ virtual reality to teach people about cancer. My husband's just bought a virtual reality headset and uh, I'm interested to see how we might be able to, to get this being used for some good. Um, do you have any program? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Do you currently have any programs or games in development that, that could be put out to the public? and? Is there somewhere that, that people can go to a website or, or some other um, resource to check out that work? Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think we should have, there was a quick question that we did miss. Uh, we want to know, someone wanted to know, was Nick's, what's Nick's dog called and if they've got an Instagram? So I think we need to address that really important question. First. I'm trying to find, she does have an Instagram handle and I'm trying to find it off camera, sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> We're tackling the big questions. All right, we'll, we'll, big questions. We'll put that. We'll put that in. We'll put that in the in the comments. Yep. But um, yeah. So the the virtual reality game. Uh, we've we've definitely we launched one last year. So it's called Malignancy VR, and you, you can either go to malignancyvr.com or go to the Excite Science website www.excitescience.com. Um, and so it's created on the Oculus Quest system. Um, it's about a three to five minute game. It's sort of currently a, a, a proto prototype game. Um, but we sort of transport you into the human lung and then you have to use different guns or therapy guns to try and defeat the cancer. And we we, took, we use a chemotherapy gun, a targeted therapy gun, an immunotherapy gun, and the game mechanics reflect how each of those different therapies work. Um, and so this project was really interesting because it was, was co-created um, with Dr. Elke Hacker from the Queensland University of Technology. And she really wanted to um, understand if virtual reality could be a, a really unique way to reinforce preventative behavior because if you look at the statistics like here in Queensland of like sunburns over the last 12 months you know when you're in school you know the typical sunburn rate over the last 12 months might be like 30 percent um up to about 50 percent when you're in grade 12 and then as soon as you become 18 it goes up to like 90 percent so it's like sort of like you just sort of forget about it and we thought maybe virtual reality could be a really unique way and um interestingly we actually just published a uh, a case study on this so it's in jmi serious games and you should be able to access I, th I think i've uploaded it to my website i'm not sure yet um but we're currently trying to sort of see how we can roll it out because the problem with virtual reality is that it's, it's a distribution challenging um if you upload it to the oculus quest store um it does make it challenging to recoup costs because currently we've sort of um launched this game just off our own backs um, so if you're trying to create a sustainable model, really bringing in more funds to expand the game, you need to try and raise some funds in, in some capacity. And so we're just trying to like explore different avenues. And, and one we're potentially looking at is getting it on some type of platform that's around um, curriculum in schools and, and really sort of enter into a subscription-based model with other games, not just in cancer, but other STEM-related games and other curriculum-aligned games um, and really trying to push the education sector who have VR headsets into this sort of um, more broader array of games. I meant to say, Ken, um, I need to come have a chat to you guys about your VR stuff. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, with our COE around Australia. Um, one of the projects out of UNSW, uh, John McGee is making some VR worlds for us where they're taking like one of the coolest ones I've played around is they took the electron uh, microscopy slices through a cell and then you can walk around on the surface of an actual rendered cancer cell and understand what's going on with the membrane folding and the receptors. And then they've taken some of our pet data. So it's part of it's about the communication outreach stuff that you guys are talking about. So communicating what's going on. Then the other part is we find it really hard to present some of the 3D data that we generate with our work all the time. 
So if we can drop in a researcher from Melbourne with our guys in Brisbane and they can walk around this 3D model of a um, animal where we're looking at where these particles are trafficking, we can explain to them much more easily what's going on and where their material's gone because otherwise they get this random colored 2D image and they don't understand what they're, what's going on. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I, really I like definitely know the game that you're talking about. I really like the Sorry, game. I know the game you're talking about. <laughs> No, you go, you go, you go, you go. I was just saying, you know, my kids uh, usually make fun of me because I don't play as much video games with them as their dad. Um, but I do like what you're doing because I think really trying to use games to teach young people, children, I would hope even, about their bodies and about cancer is really a very important way to empower them later in life to understand when these things happen to them, their friends, their families. It's really important, I think, um, that we educate the public. I mean, as clinicians, as scientists, I think that should be part of our responsibility and our moral obligation back to society. So good work. Mm, I, I, yeah, I really agree. And I think, like, it, to me, it seems like there's a common theme around communication. And I think that's, that's really an, an important point. And I think when it comes to communicating, it's all about the audience. and there's different audiences out there and they do need different mediums to interact and engage with the content. And I think when it comes to a, you know, a complex topic such as cancer, I think the more diversity and the ways we communicate that research and, and the biology and those prevention messaging, I think is the better, the better it is. Do you have any prevention games, Ken? <laughs> uh, well, the, the idea of the, the virtual reality was trying to get into prevention, but we decided to sort of start with a more familiar game mechanic and then we were going to create okay. mini games that would eventually go back and demonstrate that prevention is better than a cure. Um, we just haven't quite received the funding yet to be able to, to launch it. So, Did we just get the answer to the question? Prevention is better than cure. Uh, Except well, I'm, happy, I'm happy to go with that. I'm happy to go with that. Not making that much worse than the cure. <laughs> <laughs> And that's probably a good segue. I suspect Ken might be getting a few emails into his inbox uh, from people wanting to get into the, the world of VR, but it's probably a good segue into what's going to be our last question. Somehow we've gotten to uh, the end of the hour, um, but what's going to be our last question that we'll pose to our panellists um, and, and each can give, a, I guess, a brief overview to the question um, coming from Gerana on YouTube. What do you each think is a realistic goal or vision that you see for curing cancer in the next five to 10 years? And that's a very short time frame when we're talking about um, development of new technologies. But is there something that you see that you think is really going to be a bit of a game changer in the next five to 10 years? Um, and what do you think that might be? What do you think we're going to see happen within that, that short to medium time frame in terms of cancer cures. Nada, perhaps we'll start with you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there is a exponential evolution and emergence of newer therapies. And what I'd like to see in the next five to 10 years is adopting different strategies faster. So we used to have chemotherapy as the mainstay of treatment. And now we're, we're coming up with more and more novel agents, more and more specific targeted agents. We're just not bringing them into the clinic as quickly as I'd like. So in the next five to 10 years, that would really make a big difference. And I think there's a big move in the public health sector to try and do that. And then the second thing is to really shortcut some of those delays by introducing diagnostic techniques and making them standard of care. So next generation sequencing, you know, pathology methodology that really allows for rapid and accurate diagnosis. And then the third is really, really going hard at that last mile and deliverability. So COVID has taught us we can use telemedicine, we can use um, technology to really be able to reach out patients and get to them so that we are delivering cancer care to patients who are far away from us like we didn't used to be able to do before. So I think we can do that in five to 10 years. We've done it very quickly with COVID. We can do that. Absolutely. Eleonora, what do you think? Well, I'm gonna be cheeky and steal an extra four years, if that's okay. And I am um, going to reference some of the modeling we've done in cervical cancer and say that at, based on our predictions, 
cervical cancer will actually be technically eliminated as a public health issue by 2035 in Australia. So that's just one example of what we can do in the ne in the near future. So I mean, NADA's gone through the um, treatment aspects of it, but from a prevention point of view, there's so much more we can do. Amazing, amazing. That is, I mean, what a, what an incredible scientific feat. Um, to basically eradicate a whole disease. Uh, Nick, what do you think? I suspect nanoparticles nano, uh, might form part of your uh, answer. Uh, I'm a little bit biased, I guess. I need to keep myself in a job for a while. Um, like Nada pointed out though, so the, the COVID response has been phenomenal. And if you look at it one way, that's the largest, fastest nanomaterial, nanomedicine trial ever done anywhere. So some of those vaccine approaches are they fall under nanomedicine if you look at them that way. So if we can do it there, why can't we do it with something else? Um, but looking at what we're doing more, uh, moving those into the clinics, we're making nanoparticles and targeted approaches with chemotherapies, radiotherapies. And that's gonna start moving more and more into the clinic. Like Nada said, they're getting closer and closer and faster to adopting new approaches. But it's really gonna be the combination of that with immunotherapies, I think. It's gonna be one of the um, key leading areas. So trying to combine the body's own response to these cancers with what we try and do. Um, so take our smart materials and get the body to do its job even better. And Ken, what, what are your thoughts on this in the next five to 10 years? What do you think we, we could realistically expect? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with two, two responses. The first one's on the treatment side. I think really understanding more of the immune system. I think we've made a lot of traction but there's a lot of like weird peculiarities and unknowns. One of the more fascinating things that have come out in the last year or two years, maybe three years, is the role of the microbiota or the gut bacteria uh, really influencing treatment responses. So um, there's definitely shown that even just changing your diet can change the gut microbiota, which can actually increase um, your response to immunotherapies. And we're even doing uh, like fecal transplants, so taking poo out from people from people who've responded and then giving the bacteria to, to people before they go on treatment and they've they've started showing to be responding more positively. So I think in the treatment space, there's some really interesting immune related stuff that we could definitely explore. Um, but going back to, to the sort of creativity side, I think we really need to have embrace more interdisciplinary type approaches to how we think about cancer. And I think um, really exploring new ways and embracing the new world. I think in academia, we can get sort of a little bit stuck in our old sort of traditional research ways. But I think if you look outside and every other industry, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn, um, both through embracing different types of social media, um, different types of design, and really begin to push the barrier forward in, in using that and, and promoting that in more different ways. So um, I don't want to say uh, prevention is better than a cure. I would say education is better than a cure. That's my approach. <laughs> Hedging your bets. Cough out. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we should probably say is the, the, the general uh, overview, for, I think from probably most of our panellists, is that there is a general sense of hope for the future that, um, that we will be able to progress uh, even more advanced technologies um, so that we will hopefully get to a point where we get a cure for more cancers than we do um, have cancers that cannot be cured. Perhaps a cure all may be uh, something that we will aspire to for a little bit longer, but certainly in the shorter term, there may be hope um, for a large number of cancers that we will at least develop more effective treatments for them. So with that, I might give a big thanks to our wonderful uh, panellists for joining us, for um, volunteering their time tonight, and to all of you in our audience who have stuck with us. Um, hopefully this has stimulated some interesting conversation um, or, or discussion points for you. You can bring them up. Now you can bring them up around the, the physical water cooler um in the morning so i encourage you to use this as the catalyst to start conversations certainly um now in terms of of the pint of science festival there are a number of events that are, are coming up that you also might find very interesting tomorrow there's a live tour of a forensic chemistry lab fantastic 
with Dr. William uh, Gee from Griffith University. That starts at 6.30 um, Eastern Standard Time, which is a fun look at behind the scenes about how fingerprints are turns, turned into forensic evidence, uh, which is a free event, but please do register um, on the Pint of Science Australia website. And there are a number of exciting pint panels uh, that are scheduled for next week. So you can check out the schedule for those also on the Pint of Science website. There are a number of people who are involved in putting these panels together and indeed the whole festival. Um, so not only a big thanks to our panellists, but also a big thanks to the Pint of Science volunteers. It is all volunteers here who've done a huge amount of work um, in the last month, especially to put together these um, events. Uh, and uh, there's also a, a small team of uh, pint panel organisers, which is wonderful. So the, the pint festival is supported by volunteers. Uh, if you have tuned in and have enjoyed what you've seen today, you are more than welcome to please leave a donation on the Pint of Science Australia website so that you can help keep this event running um, in future years. I think that it's a wonderful um, approach for engagement of uh, between people coming from different areas, especially um, scientists with the general community. There's a QR code um, that you can scan on your phone that will take you to a website and you can make a very kind donation if you're so inclined. And lastly, a final thanks to, again, to our wonderful panelists tonight for joining us, to you, our wonderful audience, for your excellent questions. We do apologize. There were some questions we did not get to. Um, there was such a lot of interest that We've really tried to cover some broad topics, but thank you all for participating. Um, and remember that uh, pint events in, in any format are all about connecting over conversations. So again, please use this as a starting point to start the discussions um, amongst yourselves and amongst your friends and family. So thank you everyone for joining us and we hope that you participate in many more Pint of Science events in the future. Have a lovely evening.